Now you're asking someone of Italian ancestry to be patient for one second. That's pretty happy. <laughs> Good luck with that. Good luck with that, right? As we continue our interview segments at the Washington Center's uh, Politics and the Media Seminar in January, we're joined this morning by Clarence Page, columnist from the Chicago Tribune. Mr. Page, I want to pick up on something you mentioned to the students inside at um, your larger, larger group presentation a few moments ago. You said, or you were discussing the um, uh, Republican presidential race as a little bit like American Idol, and me meaning who's up, who's down, who's winning, who's losing. Mm -hmm. Is that good for the political process? And similarly, is that good for the media process? I don't think it does any harm, actually, uh, because even with all of the ratings and the audience that they've gotten, still as of a week or so ago, half the public still didn't know who the candidates were. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Even after all this, you know, it amazes me. Cause I think, I think we, inside the bubble of the media, forget that other people don't care about it as much as we do. Mm -hmm. And so, to me, number one, uh, the value of, of TV and the internet and all of it is to get people into the tent, as they said in the early days of TV. Mm -hmm. uh, get that audience out there involved in the process so that they care who gets elected president. So that they care about the ideas being discussed, big government, small government, taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that it's not just the activists. Uh, because this, I think this is one of the great untold stories. I've told a little, little bit of it. But, you know, the, the undecided voters and the independent swing voters, everybody talks about them and how important they are. You know, they aren't as important, uh, 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 academic studies show they aren't as important <laughs> as we think. Uh, for one thing, most of them, they call themselves independent, uh, the swing voters. but. Most of them, 85% or more, almost always or always vote for the same party. And yeah, they call themselves independent. They just either don't want to call themselves Republican or Democrat, they don't want to be identified with <laughs> the, the party they're voting for, uh, or they're so apathetic that they don't even think of themselves as belonging to a party. So they can't answer that question any other way than to say they're independent. And so, uh, what you really, the elections are really decided more by the activists. And so, there's always this debate in campaigns so whether, you, whether you run a campaign aimed at the moderate swing voters or at the base voters. Well, in the primary debates, the base is everything. So, that's what we're seeing uh, in this primary process on TV. And, uh, okay, why are people up and down, up and down? Because there's a dynamic going on inside the Republican Party right now. They're having a civil war in their own party, a battle of ideas. Uh, that's the ABM movement, anybody but Mitt. Uh, there is, uh, you know, Mitt Romney is the traditional Republican. He's the favorite of the party establishment. But the party has changed in the last couple of years where you've got this energized Tea Party base now, the energized right wing of the party, the anti-tax wing, the, the anti-government, if you will, wing. Uh, and uh, they don't care about the old traditions. You know, they just want somebody who's going to get out there and beat Obama with a right-wing agenda. Beating Obama is not, with the establishment, just beat Obama. <laughs> just get a Republican in there is everything. But with, with that activist wing, they care about ideas. Now, they may not be ideas I agree with, but they, I admire that they care about ideas. Uh, and the Democratic Party has their wing like that, too. It's just the Democrats are, are more notorious for fighting among themselves. But, but I think it's all part of the story. And uh, uh, is it good for democracy? The main thing is we are at a time of change in this country mm -hmm. right now. And uh, anybody who came into this process this year thinking that this was not a change election <laughs> uh, has got to start rethinking that. Because the ideas we're talking about, we are debating the New Deal right now. And we are debating whether or not Goldwater was right. And we're debating whether or not Ronald Reagan uh, really was a true conservative or not, and where his idea is good for the country. And we're debating whether or not Newt Gingrich did good or harm on Capitol Hill when he changed the debate back in the 90s. All of that is in, being contested in this election. With all of that, then, as the setup, the, the, the traditional notion is, and we'll use the Republicans since there's an, an incumbent Democrat, right. the, the notion for the Republicans is obviously you have to tack right during the primary and then move to the middle yeah. during the general election. Just the opposite of the Democrats. Just but the yeah, opposite of the that's Democrats. That's how our process works. Is that going to be more difficult, then? Let's, just, let's oh, sure. presume that it's Mitt Romney who's, who's the nominee, just based upon where he stands oh, yeah. in the polls and the money he has and the networking, the background, etc. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be more difficult for him in relation to previous Republican candidates for president? Mm -hmm. And how will the media react when they get that, for lack of a better mm -hmm. phrase, that flip-flop statement from him? Yeah, well, 
uh, first of all, uh, yeah, that will be hard for them. It's hard for Democrats when they go too far out on the left. Uh, and uh, that's what happened with McGovern, Mondale, <laughs> Dukakis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've got plenty of experience with this. And Republicans, it really hadn't happened to them so much as Barry Goldwater, which was uh, a disaster for Republicans, but they, they recouped. Uh, but, the, um, but, you know, uh, this is our system. The people talk about it, complain about it, say it goes on too long, and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, those countries that they compare us to, you know, England and others, which are you know, three or four week campaign, those are parliamentary systems. Everybody already knows the candidates before the campaigning starts. Mm -hmm. They don't need to have uh, everything. Whereas we got, we are like American Idol. Anybody can run. Just show up. Who heard of Herman Cain before this mm -hmm. campaign? No, who really heard of Michelle Bachman except people who watch political talk shows? Uh, uh, Ron Paul has his own cult following, and they are cult-like. God bless them. They are young, energetic. They are, they're internet savvy. I've, I've been following them for years, but most people had, they had no idea. But Ron Paul has generated more excitement this time than before. But it is like American Idol. Uh, but that's what we wanted. That's what our founders wanted in this country. We wanted a system that was different, that was slower, uh, that was accountable in a different kind of way. Uh, and uh, that, and also one that, as it turns out, is more easily manipulated by <laughs> by uh, big money, uh, big money media, and all that. But for all the complaining I hear, uh, you know, you go to England, they complain about their system too. One of the themes that, <coughs> excuse me, one of the themes that we've discussed with the students this week, among many, is the fact that technology has changed both the practice of journalism and the preparation for journalism. So let me t tackle each of those uh, separately. First, the craft or the profession itself. Um, you were making the joke uh, inside about you remember the days when you were dealing with Radio Shack computers that were mm -hmm. really not computers in the classic sense of the word as we use the term today. How has the technology change made the craft of journalism easier more difficult, or are those, or do neither of those terms apply? Um, let me do more difficult first um, by uh, putting us out of business. They made it more difficult <laughs> mm -hmm. by um, uh, forcing us all to think about profits, uh, to think about the business side. I came up in the era where we thought we were too good and too sanctified and mm -hmm. <laughs> too purified to worry about those advertising circulation people over there. We are, we are the pure journalists uh, above it all and uh, uh, that kind of thing. No, the business is more entrepreneurial now. Uh, and um, the internet empowers, and, and new technology empowers. The, mm -hmm. the, the flip cams, the uh, uh, various um, uh, recording devices. I mean, my iPhone has a whole TV studio in it, really. You know, those kind of sure. facilities. I, 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 I can shoot movies, edit everything uh, right in the iPhone. Um, I'm just, you know, I told my son, this is your uh, this is your century. I'm just lucky to be walking around in it, you know, because this is science fiction to me. Uh, uh, back, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s, you know, so we, this, this, this was all science fiction. Now it's happening. And what do we do with it? Yeah, it's made things easier, heavens. I, um, no question about it, I uh, can, can fact check myself quickly, uh, but I'm also uh, required to discipline myself. Uh, you know, uh, as I was telling the students, you know, don't rely on Wikipedia without uh, double and triple checking uh, to make sure that uh, the information is correct. But we were supposed to do that anyway. Journalists are always supposed to double check and triple check. And uh, the, sl the slogan of the old Chicago City News Bureau, now defunct, uh, was if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 uh, that's supposed to be our slogan. And that's what separates the reliable journalists from the unreliable journalists. And, th and that's where you get your edge in this business. So yeah, uh, there's more competition. In, uh, in all kinds of ways. Uh, there's economic pressures put on the old media now, but people still come to the old media when they want reliable information, and that's our franchise. And we're finding ways now, after all the, the calamitous shakeups we've had in the last few years now, uh, things have settled down, at least for the time being, and um, uh, we're making a profit again. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, um, I don't know if we ever stop making a profit, there's always a question of how big of a profit, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Back to the, the corporate Wall Street owners just wanted these humongous 22% profits. It was twice as much as Exxon, for heaven's sake, you know. Uh, but, um, yeah, uh, everything is changing. But, uh, you know, we're supposed to know about change. We're journalists. We're just not used to this much change happening to us. My last question for you is going to be this. If you had an opportunity to um, 
make a complete sea change for journalism education mm -hmm. in terms of what college students had to learn, what they had to experience, what they had to know, etc. In other words, I gave you a magic wand and it would happen. Yeah. What would go into those changes that you believe would be necessary? You know what? That question is so inappropriate for me because I go out to colleges and talk to students and I'm always learning more from them <laughs> than they're learning from me. <laughs> like flip cams. I didn't know what a flip cam was. Well, I'm going to have to speak to students at, at uh, some uh, government students at Ohio State and they were running their own blog. They weren't even journalism students or broadcasting. They were government students. Mm -hmm. But they were running their own blog site and they were learning more about print and broadcast from running that site uh, than I learned in most of my journalism education uh, in college, um, except that uh, so much of mine came at the student newspaper, uh, but they're learning print and broadcast and, and the internet, all these new technologies. And I think, um, you know, I would just say, uh, keep digging deeper into what you've already got because you've got such ter terrific resources on campus now. And uh, uh, the library, whether it's the old-fashioned book library or online libraries, uh, new technologies and new ways of using those technologies that are being developed. This is a young person's business now. You're talking about um, everything involving the Internet. Is a, you know, uh, me and everybody, every other, other boomer parent or grandparent I know, uh, when they... Uh, running into trouble, they say, well, I guess I better call, call my, my nephew or call mm -hmm. my teenager because <laughs> you, know, you, need, you need to have, have a teenager at home to uh, mm -hmm. uh, show you all this stuff. I'm, I'm still, uh, my son is still showing me how to, how to hook up Netflix mm -hmm. <laughs> on, on the TV. There was, a, kind of thing. there was a problem with my phone the other day, my, mm -hmm. my, uh, my uh, uh, Android-based phone, and, and uh, I posted on Facebook, does anybody know how to fix it? And someone wrote back to me and said, you've got a 12-year-old at home, it's simple, ask him. And, and I, was, I was almost tempted to do that. Well, you should have done it. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> he probably would have known. I mean, when my son was 22 now, when he was 12, he showed me how to download files, mm -hmm. you know, when he was 12. And, uh, uh, but, but that's what's so great and exciting about this because, uh, uh, you know, th this is the generation that's coming up now that truly never seen an instruction manual. Uh, they just take, the, take whatever the new gadget is and they just figure it out themselves. themselves. And they, they write a new language for it while they're working with it because they find new ways to mm -hmm. use it. And you know we were the same way back way back in the Stone Age when I was a youngster, showing my parents how to how, how to work the TV remote, mm -hmm. uh, how to do the um, the uh, push button phone, and, and and later how to program the VCR and the answering machines. You know uh, the, the only difference now is look how much the technology has changed just in the last five years, and then the five years before that it's just speeding up so. And I love it. I'm just hanging in here to see what's going to happen next because uh, I think it's great. But I uh, know for young people today, the best I can offer is the old school advice that amidst all this crazy new stuff that's happening, all these new innovations, all this excitement and this explosion of information, what's your edge? Um, the late John H. Johnson, who founded Ebony and Jet magazine, uh, back in the 40s, when he was a young man, he borrowed uh, money. What he borrowed, I think it was $300. Um, by by uh, ha hawking his mother's furniture, <laughs> his mother. I'm sure, she was thrilled. <laughs> well, she, she backed him up on it. He was such a bright kid. And he, he was a master salesman, even mm -hmm. even as as a young man. Uh, he talked his mother uh, into this venture to start this magazine, which became Black World, and then Jed and Ebony, and this media empire uh, that sprouted up from it all. And I had the honor of interviewing him once back in the eighties, and. I uh, asked, uh, you know, you know, what advice do you give young people? And he said uh, three words, make yourself indispensable. Uh, where, <laughs> wherever you go, it's very whatever true. you do, whatever job you've got, uh, however low level, you know, I'm talking to a student outside here, well, I want to see what job fits me. I said, no, you got to see what job you can get right now, you know, and then get in that job and make yourself indispensable. Because look at all the, all the TV network and movie studio heads who started in the mailroom. It's a classic story in our business, starting in the mailroom, uh, starting as, uh, as, as a, uh, what we used to call a copy boy, and now they call a copy clerk, mm -hmm. uh, in our old school newsroom in Chicago. I don't even know if we have copy clerks anymore, because <laughs> the, 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 the web, not particularly well, but anyway, uh, yeah, uh, make yourself indispensable, because uh, for, for kids who are in school now, uh, they're, they're, they're brilliant. Uh, but remember, there's a whole class full of brilliant people graduating with you <laughs> out there, sending their resumes out, 
and you got to cut yourself out of the herd. You've got to make yourself indispensable to whoever it is that you're working for. And in higher education, we also realize that we have them for a grand total of four years. Thank you. Mr. Page, great talking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank having you. me. You bet. It. Thank you.